Thank you for the, uh, for the kind invitation and, and, and the warm words. Uh, in terms of the blurb that we put out there for this talk, I think we were essentially saying that, uh, that the charity sector has been, you know, for some time trying to adapt in the face of a sustained challenge to become more, quote unquote, business-like. Um, and so tonight I intend to try and set out and explain how I see the changes that are taking place uh, affecting the nature and the texture of charity work. I am going to draw on uh, some of the research from my recent William Leach Fellowship over at Durham, uh, particularly when I get into discussing the nature of money uh, and of value. Um, and so in that sense, part of this talk will derive from, from that, that focus and that period of study. Um, but, but largely this talk tonight is tangential to it. Um, as John just said, I was really more interested in, in that piece of work looking at, uh, well, I was looking at a phenomenon called collective giving, microphilanthropy, uh, and it was cited within St. John's College in the theology department at Durham. Um, so if you have any appetite for any of that, I have brought the final publication along, uh, but it comes with a health warning that it's really, you know, for anybody who's got a, a substantial appetite for Christian theology as well as for economics, as well as for philanthropy, etc. So it gets into all that stuff. Um, which for some of you will be really exciting and for some of you will be incredibly dull. Um, but uh, for, so for those of you who are attuned to such things, you, you may well notice um, sort of uh, submerged, you know, within this talk, there is a sort of a Christian ethic, but it's very much under the waterline and, uh, and not sort of uh, immediately visible above the surface. Um, so the commercialization of, of the charity sector, uh, I guess just a little bit about me as well in terms of what, what brings me here to, to do a talk on a subject like this. Um, so my early career, I uh, was as a youth worker in the inner city and, uh, and that's where I sort of cut my teeth really and, and my journey then over, over many years was one of, uh, you know, essentially, you know, beginning out as, as a young man being very much led by my heart uh, and trying to, you know, change the world in my own little way uh, and then kind of growing up and becoming a bit more reflective um, and essentially trying to then think through as I got into management and indeed I think it was probably the last time I was uh, I spent any serious time was in a, bit, in a business school uh, was I did a, uh, I did a, a, a master's at uh, Salford Business School probably I think around about 2000 and four, five, six, uh, in the evenings, um, trying to sort of, you know, brush up on uh, how on earth to, uh, to deal with some of this, you know, commercialization stuff that even then I could sense emerging, uh, but also trying to engage my brain into some of the methods and methodologies uh, of how a lasting impact could be achieved. So most of my sort of career path has been uh, around children and families, um, so around the edge of the care system, the education system, youth homelessness, uh, there's still big areas of interest to me. Um, although now, uh, so the last sort of two or three years, I've been working essentially solo as a consultant, as a um, mainly in the northeast, working directly for charities, uh, but also on behalf of some of the big funders. Uh, so I do quite a bit of work on behalf of Lloyd's Bank Foundation, Greg's Foundation, Lottery, etc. So much of the evidence in tonight's talk is, is sort of drawn from that 20 years of uh, career history in the charity sector, but particularly and especially, I think, from the last two or three years as a consultant, getting to sort of, you know, peel up the carpet and look underneath, uh, you know, many, many different charities of different shapes and sizes. Um, so I hope I do a good job of describing the ways that commercialization uh, as I see it, risks undermining some of the core characteristics uh, that I think are, are, are very precious and special to the charity sector. Uh, and in so doing, to provoke some debate and conversation um, in a little while, in, in a half an hour or so. So, just to get stuck in then, the, uh, the charities that I work with um, certainly are businesses uh, in the sense that, you know, many of them have large turnovers, um, some of them you know, being multi-million pound undertakings, lots of staff, uh, and operating you know, broadly within that sector that you might call human services. 
Uh, you know, so this morning, I was with Age UK, they're one of my clients, so they, you know, they've got a very sort of busy operation in North Tyneside, dealing with older people, this afternoon working on behalf of a deaf organisation and up at the, uh, one of the big hospitals working on their behalf. So I think I, I recognise four different ways um, in which I've observed charities trying to become more business-like, and then I'm going to tack a fifth one onto it, which is commercialisation. So the initial four would be becoming more business-like in terms of leadership competence. Uh, and so that's about you know, doing the right things, about having strategic focus, uh, in terms of management competence, uh, so doing things right, uh, and especially around people and around becoming a learning organization. Um, becoming more business-like in terms of organizational systems and processes and predictability and trying to emerge out of the sort of chaos of amateurism that um, certainly you know, some charities, uh, and indeed many businesses, are, uh, are still caught up in. Um, becoming more business-like in terms of an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, so about creativity and about change and about becoming opportunity-oriented and developing new programs and services. So I think they are all fantastic ways that I see charities becoming more business-like but then more recently, I've seen tacked onto that list um, that becoming more business-like means becoming more commercialized. And I would interpret that as you know, the monetization of services um, and methods of income generation becoming the primary determinant of that organization's direction. Uh, and I'm going to unpack that for you in a little bit more detail. So there we are then, five ways in which charities can become more business-like Four of them don't involve becoming more commercialized. To me, um, commercialization becomes problematic when that involves cash becoming king. And by that I mean that money becomes the primary factor in all decisions, the ultimate measure of value within the organization. Philip Goodchild argues that money becomes a religion when it becomes the supreme value against which all other values can be measured. Now, for many charities, I find there's a lack of clarity around how value can be measured by anything other than money. And I find that not only problematic, but also deeply ironic. Um, and that irony is rooted in understanding the nature of money itself. Because money isn't really what we commonly think it is. Um, those waxy bits of paper that we carry around in our purses and wallets um, are currency, but that's only a very narrow representation of what money is. Um, put simply, money is a portable store of abstract value. Uh, and there I'm quoting Simmel from his classic book on the philosophy of money, which I think was from 1900. Um, so it's the abstract nature of money which allows it to function as a means of exchange. And so that's the sort of, you know, one of the second primary sort of characteristics of money. Uh, because it's a means of exchange, it allows for the fulfillment of our desires to possess actual value according to our personal priorities. Uh, so to us, actual value might be security in terms of a home, uh, it might be health, in terms of it might be a gym membership, uh, it might be transport, it might be owning a car, it might be companionship which we might purchase through a social life. Uh, and of course it might be projecting to others the appearance that we're doing well by the type of home we have and the type of gym we use and the type of car we own and the type of social life that we, uh, that we choose to enjoy. So they're all actual value to us. They're the things that actually matter to us as people. Now, I believe there's something fundamentally different in the nature of charities as contrasted to other forms of incorporated business. 
And the difference is found in how value is understood. And I'll put this out to you as a discussion point for later, that the core purpose of a charity is to take money, which is the world's most effective store of value, but is in and of itself of no value, and tra transform its latent value that's stored within it into various forms of social value. So it's like a process of alchemy, but in reverse. Gold is the starting point rather than the end point. And so we might take money, we might put money in at the beginning of the machine, and out of the other end of it, we get childhood nutrition, or disease immunization, or ecological restoration, or emotional well-being. It's a process of alchemy taking place. And so I'll press that point a little bit with you in terms of your personal ethics. So would you, ask yourself this question, you know, would you rather celebrate and congratulate yourself for generating more childhood nutrition or more disease immunization or more ecological restoration or more emotional well-being? Would that leave you feeling satisfied and good about yourself? Or would it be generating a larger amount of money in your bank account? What is your personal priority when it comes to the nature of value itself? I hope we'd all consider the formalist to be of greater value than that latter point I mentioned. So you might expect then that charities would be the first to understand and appreciate uh, that what we might refer to as social value trumps mere financial value as an arbiter of achievement. Uh, and that they don't, I think, is down to the third characteristic of money. I've already mentioned money as a store of value and money as a means of exchange. But there's a third quality of money. And when you read the philosophy of money, um, you get into, and that's money as a standard measure of account. The fact that money is a standardized uh, way of counting, and pounds and pence are our universally aware, uh, agreed way of accounting for that value, then it's a very straightforward way to measure input and output. We have people trained in doing that. We call them accountants. They've got software that people have spent millions and millions of pounds developing, and it's all very convenient. Uh, we've got KPIs to show us whether we're leading or whether we're lagging, and it's all hooked into how well the organization is doing in terms of its financial bottom line. And so it appears to me that in many charities, cash is not king because charity executives fail to see other forms of money, uh, sorry, other forms of value beyond money. I think cash is king because cash is convenient. It can simply be very difficult to measure and monitor other forms of value that are being created reliably and accurately. There's an awful lot of counting going on within charities, as there is within all businesses, but oftentimes much of the counting that's going on is not counting, you know, the metrics are not measuring things that are of actual value. And that's really what, in my business, I spend most of my days doing, is helping people to try and determine what is important to us as an organization, what are the outcomes that we're really hoping to see through the service that we're delivering, and how can we reliably measure that in a way that kind of tells us whether we're actually making any difference and achieving anything. I think that's that, that the challenge there around the metrics and around measuring a value, I think is often best revealed in charity funder relationships. And so walk into any charity anywhere in the country anywhere you choose, and you're likely to find some member of staff scratching their head and feeling no small amount of angst about a monitoring report that their 
currently trying to fill out for a grant funder or service commissioner. Now, I'm pleased to say that in terms of the foundations that I work for, they seem to be working really hard to get their grant monitoring right. Um, they really don't want that six monthly return to be overly burdensome to the charity. But it's also recognized that it's an important part of the accountability process. You know, nobody wants to invest tens and even hundreds or even millions of pounds um, into an organization without some sense of being able to recognize whether the difference that was intended is actually being made. But even that said, there are still a lot of people counting widgets, filling out forms and spreadsheets, sending them off to somebody they've never met, who ticks a box to say the return has arrived and files it away, never to be seen again. It happens all the time. Now, many of my clients have diversified their business model in recent years, um, often by necessity, and they're now involved in delivering services that have been commissioned by local authorities. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is where maybe some of my own personal angst is probably going to get sort of vented to the room. Uh, and I say this as somebody who also, you know, is an elected member and is only recently, but, you know, on a bit of a personal mission to try and fix some of this from the inside as well. Um, some of the monitoring arrangements that I come across are quite patently ridiculous. Quarterly reporting on 100 plus different data points. I've got one client in Newcastle um, that reports to a local authority funder on 350 different quarterly metrics. Can you imagine how much? And, and most of these numbers are, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, how many one-legged women did you treat on a Wednesday? Um, it's really in that sort of realm of madness. Um, and there's another complicating feature there as well um, because, you know, it's that, that contracting and commissioning process really seems to me to have accelerated the commercialization within charities. Um, and, uh, and many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the excellent work done right here in this business school by Toby Lowe and, and Dawn Plimmer. And they describe much more ably than I could um, the way that commissioners uh, devise these monitoring regimes essentially as a means of control based on a lack of understanding of how to deal with complexity. And they would argue, um, Toby and Dawn, if I've grasped their work correctly, and I've tried to, uh, that these reporting regimes are inhuman, uh, they fail to generate learning, and they don't attend to the broader system in which change happens. Uh, I think at the heart of Toby's recent publication is this idea of human learning systems, um, and many commissioning contracts are the opposite. Um, and so but there, are, there are another two things, though, that really trouble me, I think, about the, uh, the contracting and commissioning process. Um, and firstly, uh, and I was having a conversation with the charity chief exec about just this point this morning, um, the one of the side effects and byproducts, I guess unintended consequences of, the, of the, uh, the sort of the ramping up of commissioning in recent years uh, has been the disrupting of local and regional networks of cooperation uh, between long-standing players in the sector. Um, and because it can involve direct competition for work. People are literally putting one another out of business. Um, you, know, it's hap you know, there are those stories, they happen. Um, in, in the region um, with a reasonable degree of regularity. Uh, but there are also fallouts within consortia arrangements. Charities get together, perhaps with a naive idea about partnership, and then find that they've been thrown into bed together, and they're, you know, under the cosh of a lead partner who um, actually may not well distribute the, um, you know, evenly... The, uh, the benefits of a contract to, to all the subcontractors. So I see that happening as well. And then there's the picture that I put up on the screen, which is that I think it also leads over time to a race to the bottom on price. Um, and so it's leading some charities in their efforts to commercialize to underbid on contracts, um, hoping that they can potentially pick up the slack through 
fundraising, uh, and then after failing to do so, have a shortfall on their budget, and either are left with, you know, folding their organization, closing the service, or, as in my experience often happens, simply offering a lower quality service. So diminishing the quality of the service for the end user, um, leading to longer waiting lists, you know, poorer quality service, etc. So, so what can be done? Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go on because I really want to have some conversation about this. So this is essentially going to be my sort of final slide. Um, I think it all comes down to that old saying that if you don't measure what you value, then you will come to value what you measure. In recent years, we've heard a lot about the emergence of purpose-led businesses. Charities ought to be the exemplar purpose-led business. If a charity can't clearly articulate why on earth it exists in terms other than to turn over enough money to keep the show on the road for another financial year, then something is very wrong. Whether we call it vision or mission or purpose, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the organization is clear about who it exists for and the positive change, that is the value that it is working to bring about through its various programs, services, and activities. And that clarity will allow a range of metrics to be developed that focus on the things that really matter, measures that show change, not just busyness, measures that are generating insight and driving learning. I call those metrics KIIs, Key Impact Indicators. They're part of what I refer to as the art of impact. And why do I call impact an art and not a science? Uh, you know, I've thought long and hard about this, about the idea of impact and what a strange concept it is. I mean, let me ask you, um, how can an impact be positive? An impact generally hurts or costs. Uh, if you went home tonight and uh, told your partner, um, I've had an impact on the way here, they'd probably give you a bit of a grimace and, and maybe look sympathetic. Um, so how can an impact be a good thing? Um, <clears throat> and that's why I've put this image of, on the screen of this sculptor chiseling away at, um, at a piece of marble. Because here's the thing, I believe that making an impact when we're involved particularly in human services and in people's lives. It's about skillful, methodical, repetitive attention to the same thing. But it's also about seeing beauty revealed over time. Uh, and this is where the art bit of the metaphor, I think, uh, works, works best, because just like, the, uh, just like a social impact... Uh, like emotional well-being or, you know, like uh, better health or, or, you know, improved nutrition or, uh, you know, better air quality. Um, all those things are incredibly valuable. And like a piece of art, it's very difficult to put a price tag on it. Um, it's so much more than the sum total of the hours that went into it. Um, and uh, similarly then, I think we've always got a challenge whenever we're trying to use financial proxies to measure value. Uh, that actually so much of what we do, so much of what the charity section, sector does um, cannot be commercialised because it's just simply impossible to put a price on. Well, thanks very much. I think it's time for us to get stuck into some questions now. I'd love to hear from you um, what you think of all that, whether you agree with that basic proposition or disagree. Let's have some debate uh, and some conversation about that now. Thanks very much for having me.